Okay, pre-AP biology students, uh, for you guys that are at home today and couldn't make it to school for whatever reason, uh, I want to cover this uh, quick lecture with you, um, which is the beginning uh, of Unit 2, which is kind of our ecology unit. So today we're just going to kind of cover some of the basics of ecosystems, and we'll continue with this uh, a little bit more later on this week as well. So we talked briefly, you know, a couple of weeks ago about this, this term, you know, an ecosystem and what an ecosystem is. This goes back to our like levels of classification, things like that, you know, population, species and community. And one of those levels was what we call an ecosystem. So kind of as a refresher, this is sort of our definition here. It says it's a particular location on earth. So it can be in a lot of different places distinguished by its particular mix of interacting biotic and abiotic components. So, I mean, let's just say, I don't know, um, a desert. You know, a desert would be a particular location on Earth, and it would have in it, you know, biotic and abiotic components. We talked about what these two terms meant uh, as well. So let's kind of review those real quick. I mean, biotic would be anything that would be considered living. So, for example, in a desert, there are plants, there are animals, you know, there are things like decomposers that live there. Uh, even the soil, you know, the soil that is in, I don't care if it's a desert or if it's a tropical rainforest or, or wherever, um, the soil actually has a living component to it. So that's what soil is. Soil isn't just dirt. Soil is both dirt and also the things that live in that dirt. So we consider soil to kind of be a living thing or a biotic component of an ecosystem. Now, abiotic are kind of all the non-living things. I'm going to move myself up here. So, for example, rainfall. You know, in the desert, there's a certain amount of rainfall that happens every year, right? The temperature in the desert. Um Water pH. There may, there may not be a lot of water in the in the desert, but if there is, that water has an acidity level to it, and that would be considered an abiotic thing. Soil acidity. The, the, the soil itself has an acid content to it. Soil texture, wind, the amount of daily sunlight that's available. I mean, for example, a desert receives a different amount of sunlight you know, per day than what we do here in in Crown Point. Uh, and I even put soil here for, for abiotic. Um, you can be a little careful with this. This is mainly for my um, AP kids, but um, I want us to understand that soil, again, is kind of a living and non-living thing. We can kind of categorize it in, in, in as both either biotic or abiotic. For example, the living components of the soil would be considered biotic, whereas the non-living components of the soil would be abiotic, if that makes sense. We'll look too deep into that, but whatever. Now, these first two are actually kind of important because they determine climate. You know, the climate in an area is all due to how much precipitation the area gets per year and what the average temperature is per year. So I do want us to understand that those two parameters there are what we call climate indicators. You know, if you're, if you're living in let's say the tundra of northern Russia, you know, you, you, you're, that area gets a different amount of rainfall or snow, and it also has a different annual temperature, you know, like, like average temperature, than let's say if you lived in the tropical rainforest. All right, so make sure we understand that those two things are what we call climate indicators. But here's a desert ecosystem. Again, there's abiotic, there's biotic factors here. You know, here's a kind of a kind of a pond ecosystem. It's a different area. You know, again, we've got all these biotic things, we've got abiotic things, and we have interactions between them. You know, for example, shrimp and tadpoles competing for mosquito larvae. You know, that's an example of two biotic factors that are interacting with one another. Right? Competition's a type of interaction. Um, duckweed. You know, this this kind of um, lily pad type of plant that floats on the surface, 
you know, absorbing sunlight to photosynthesize. Now, there's only so much sunlight in this area where this pond is, so you know that would be a biotic factor interacting with an abiotic factor, right? So, you know, there's tons of these interactions that go on in every single ecosystem, and really, what defines the ecosystem is what are those those biotic factors? What are they? What are the abiotic factors, and what are those interactions like? All right, so that's kind of what again kind of defines what an ecosystem is. All right, now today we're going to start talking about some of these interactions, you know, between organisms. I, you know, since this is biology class, we're going to kind of focus more on the biotic stuff more than like the abiotic stuff. If you take you know environmental science, then we might look a little bit more at the abiotic things, but uh, here's a term here, it's called symbiosis. Symbiosis means an interaction between two different organisms living in close proximity to one another. You know, here's a good example in this picture here, which I'll come back to in a second, but you know, it's a clownfish and what we call a sea anemone. There's that word again that I hate, sea anemone. Anyway, these are two you know, organisms that live together in, close, in a close relationship uh, and it's called symbiosis. So this is a symbiotic relationship. Now, when it comes to symbiosis, there are five different types that we're going to kind of explore. Today, we're going to talk strictly about the first three. And then a little bit later on this week, we'll cover the other two. Because they're kind of, I'm not saying they're different, but there's a little bit, a little bit more that goes into these two than the other three. So commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism be the first three that we cover today. Um, let's first talk about uh, commensalism. Commensalism is um, what we call a plus zero relationship. And what that means is that one organism, you know, in this relationship is going to benefit. So that organism would be the plus. The other organism really isn't helped and it's not really harmed either. So in that aspect, they're kind of neutral. So we call it a plus zero or a plus neutral uh, relationship. Uh, again, a really good example is the clownfish and the sea anemone. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with this type of relationship, you know, if, if you know anything about sea anemones, uh, they have stinging cells. They're kind of like little jellyfish, right? So they'll sting their prey, and that's kind of how they feed. Uh, but clownfish actually have an adaptation. They actually have kind of a slimy coating around them. You can't really see it in the picture, but that slimy coating actually allows them to swim through the tentacles without being stung. So that's really good for the jellyfish, you know, because they, they do that. Um, it allows the jellyfish to hide from predators. You know, if a predator does come in there, they're going to get stung by the sea anemone. Um, so again, there's kind of this relationship here that's, you know, it kind of helps the clownfish. It doesn't really do very much for the sea anemone. Um, so it's kind of a plus zero relationship there. Another one is the monarch butterfly uh, and, a, and a plant. It's called milkweed. Um, monarch butterflies are kind of notorious for laying their eggs uh, on this, this one particular plant. Um, this plant actually has a toxin in it that the, the butterfly larvae, the little caterpillars, they, they'll actually eat, they'll, they'll feed on the leaves of the plant and the plant has this toxin in it, right? So, you know, as the larvae grow and they get bigger, they, they accumulate this toxin in their body. Now the toxin is completely safe to the butterfly and, and the larvae, but anything that eats the caterpillar or eats the butterfly they're going to get that toxin in their blood and they're going to die. So this, this relationship really benefits the butterfly. Um, the milkweed doesn't really suffer at all because of it. I mean, the caterpillar just eats a little bit of the milkweed. It doesn't really kill it or damage it. And so the, 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 the milkweed doesn't really get anything out of the deal, uh, whereas the butterfly benefits tremendously from that. So again, it's kind of a commensalistic relationship. Uh, mutualism. Mutualism is another type of symbiosis, right? So we've got these two organisms that are kind of living together. 
Um, but this one is a plus plus. So we've got one organism that's going to benefit, and we have the other organism that's going to benefit. Probably the most, I guess, classic example of mutualism is um, a bumblebee and a flower. You know, when, you know, the bumblebee is going to come up to the flower and, and get food, you know, get nectar or you know, whatever they eat from the, from the flower. And if you'll notice on the bumblebee are all these little yellow speckles. Right? Those are grains of pollen. So when the bumblebee, you know, goes from one flower to the next, to the next, to the next, it spreads that pollen and that's how the plant reproduces. So the plant gets something out of the deal, right? They get a way to reproduce and the bumblebee gets food, right? So there's kind of a win-win relationship there. This is another example. It's called a cleaner wrasse and a grouper. A grouper is a, is a fish, this big fish here. Uh, I mean, they're, they're huge. They're like as big as my desk. You know, I, I've actually scuba dove with these things before and they're, they're kind of intimidating because they're so big, but they're completely harmless. But these groupers are so big that they occasionally get like slime and fungus and you know, algaes that like grow on, on, the, on the fish. Sometimes they grow inside the, the gills of the fish. But the cleaner wrasses are these little blue fish here. What they do is they just swim around the grouper constantly. They're almost to the point where they're kind of a pest, but they don't really do any, and, and they don't really bother the grouper too much. What they're doing is they're picking off all the funguses and all the algaes uh, that are going to grow on this grouper and, and potentially maybe cause some damage to it. So essentially, they're kind of giving the grouper a bath. You know, they're kind of cleaning it and, and, and kind of getting rid of all those things that are growing on it. So the, the grouper gets clean and the cleaner wrasses get food, you know, which again benefits both organisms here. Um, this one here is really, I think, kind of an interesting one. Um, coral polyps, which is what you're seeing here, this, this whole structure here, or this one over here, this whole thing is what we call a coral polyp. So like a, like a coral reef is made up of all these little tiny organisms. These are actually animals. They're actually very similar to sea anemones, uh, also related to jellyfish. They're, they're, they're in the same group as them, they're the same type of family. Um, so they're, they're just little animals. Inside of the animal, you see all this kind of greenish, brownish stuff? That is an actual algae, it's a plant. It's called zooxanthellae. That zooxanthellae algae, that plant, lives inside of the coral polyp. So there's this symbiotic relationship here. But what's interesting about it is it's actually mutualistic. So it says here the algae that live in the coral, you know, these algae get nutrients, so they get a way to feed. They, 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 you know, they, they need things from the coral. The coral gets oxygen gas, because these are photosynthetic, right? They're plants. So they produce oxygen. They also help in waste removal. So they help the coral animal. They help it remove some of its own waste. Um, corals also get some of their food from the algae. Remember the algae, since they're photosynthetic, they, they make sugars. And those sugars can be eaten by the coral. So again, we have this relationship where, you know, one organism benefits and the other one benefits if they're living together. Now, one thing that we're seeing, which is kind of sad, is we're seeing um, this relationship is being compromised. Uh, there's a, 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 an environmental problem called coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is when the zooxanthellae algae leave the polyp. They just leave it, they leave the animal. And that happens um, usually if environmental conditions start to change. You know, for example, this what you're seeing here in this picture, this, this coral head, um, this is actually a, a piece of dead coral. Uh, the animals are dead because the, the algae has left. And what you're seeing here is just basically the skeleton. It's kind of the limestone that's left behind. And this picture here is the same thing. You know, here we have a, a healthy coral reef over here on the left. This was taken in December of 2014. Over on the right is essentially the same reef. Um, you know, really only a couple of months later, you know, so you can see all the algae that is left and it's left behind 
basically just the skeletons uh, of the coral animals about that. And this is becoming a problem uh, mainly because of humans. You know, one thing that causes this to occur is a change in ocean temperature. You guys are all familiar a little bit with global warming. Well, global warming has caused ocean tempers to ocean temperatures to rise. And those, those little algaes are extremely sensitive to that temperature change. So if the temperature gets too warm for them, uh, the algae will just be expelled. They'll just leave uh, the coral animal. Uh, and that will you know, ruin this symbiotic relationship and it'll, it'll cause the death of the coral. Another one is a decrease in water clarity. I mean, now I want you to think here, you know, these are little plants, these little, these little zoosanthellae. So if the water gets cloudy, you know, and that means the sunlight's not going to be able to penetrate and they're not going to be able to photosynthesize. You know, these corals, these, you know, these, these are found in tropical waters where the water is extremely clear and it's all, they're also very shallow waters. So, you know, if there's any water clarity issues, let's say there's boat traffic or scuba divers and snorkelers that are kicking up all the dirt on the bottom of the ocean, and that's going to make the water less, you know, less clear. It's going to make it a lot more difficult for them to photosynthesize. So these are human-based problems. You know, it's gotten to the point where a lot of coral reefs, I know down in Florida, like in the Florida Keys, they, they don't allow visitors to, to some of those areas, all because they don't, they don't want to you know, risk the water clarity problems uh, that are associated with, with potential coral, uh, coral bleaching. All right, the last one here today is parasitism. Now, parasitism is kind of a plus minus. So imagine you know, if you have, let's say, a tapeworm, which that's what you're seeing here on the right-hand side. This is a tapeworm. Uh, right here is actually the, the little head of the tapeworm. And, you know, in case you're interested, the only way to get rid of a tapeworm is to get rid of the head. Because if you, well, let's say you cut the tapeworm right here and the rest of it is gone, let's say you just poop it out or something. But if the head is still there, it'll grow back again. Um, so you need to get, get rid of the head. So what they have is like they have drugs that you can take like pills. And it like literally will like put the tapeworm to sleep. So it like loses its grip on your intestine and then you can just poop out the entire thing. And some of these tapeworms are like 10, 12 feet long. You know, so imagine that, but don't think too hard about it. Anyway, it's a plus minus. So like one organism benefits, you know, the, the, the parasite is going to benefit. And the other organism um, is harmed. Now, what's, what's interesting about a parasitic relationship is very rarely does the host... That's the individual that has the parasite. Um, rarely does that individual die. You know, the, the, the parasite doesn't want you to die or the animal that it's living in to die because if the animal dies, then the parasite's going to die along with it. So, um, you know, most of them don't cause death, but they do cause uh, diseases. Um, these are called pathogenic uh, organisms. They do cause disease. You know, viruses, bacteria, funguses, protists, there are some worms, like tapeworms, that are parasitic. Um, but these things, again, the, the, the parasite benefits, the host is harmed. You know, they suffer. You know, don't usually die, but they can die. Uh, vectors is a vocab term here. These are organisms that carry parasites from one person to the next. Um, insects are kind of notorious uh, vectors. You know, they carry the disease from one human to another. Um, so make sure we rats do that. You know, the bubonic plague, you know, back in the whatever, 14th century or something, you know, that was uh, carried by a vector. Uh, there were fleas that were actually biting rats and then they were biting humans. Um, so the flea actually was the vector, but the rats could also bite people if you live in you know, unsavory conditions, I suppose, but that could also have been a vector. Anyway, uh, so parasitism, that's going to end uh, the notes for today. Uh, make sure you do the lecture note review in Buzz, and I'll see you guys soon. Take care.